as you know, this is the measure of an episode. If you are coming back wow. after listening regularly, Just jumping right into it, then hey, we're back. And this is the measure of an episode where it is our continuing mission to explore <laughs> what makes Star Trek proper Star Trek and not just slobbering all over the knob of nostalgia and memories dick. I'm Jonathan. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I had some I had I'm some so thoughts about back. this episode. <laughs> I'm so flabbergasted. I can't even I don't even know my part. And I'm Paul and the criteria by which we judge these episodes, number one, <laughs> is there science fiction inherent in the episode? Hmm. Number two, is that right? I don't remember. Yeah, that's it's right. been so that's long. Right. We should say, before I get on to number two, uh, <laughs> that you hold the that reason we were gone, I'll, yeah, just hold on to that number two just for a few more minutes. The reason that we were gone uh, was not because we're lazy, not because we, we burned out. No, no, no. What is little known is that we have been uh, exploring the virtues of the first 60 years of All in the Family. Not All in the Family. What's what's a what's a long-running soap opera so I can continue this joke? Uh, as the world turns? As the world turns. Days of yeah. our lives? The first 60 years of Days of Our Lives slash As the World Turns. Have we talked about this where I, I felt like if you wanted to be a completist and watch all of a particular soap opera... It's impossible. You would have to watch for like eight hours a day for... <laughs> for like six years or something like that to even get caught up right. just so you can continue. Yeah. And <laughs> with the unrelated storyline. Right. Well, and the, the story continues as you're watching. So you have to, you have to factor That's in right. all of yeah. that time that you're missing as you started. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a new hole popping up in the dam after you put your finger in one, right. another one just pops up. Right. Uh, and number two, is that science fiction novel or unique in some way? Is that right? Yeah. And number three, is there a moral or ethical conundrum uh, in the episode? I'm Paul. And I'm Jonathan. And this week, we watched what we meant Wait to watch. No, no, no. Wait. I got I got another thing. Before before okay. we get into this, I okay. know we've been gone for a long time. <laughs> and I know that we have a lot to catch up on. And I know that Picard season three is transformative okay. in the Star Trek universe. Well, yeah, it's out there. We need to, get, we need to catch up because yeah. Strange New Worlds is coming out, et cetera, et cetera. But right. first... I feel like it's it's pertinent that we discuss one thing okay. that I have I have discovered in our absence. Oh, okay. Are you ready for this? Yeah, uh, sure. Ready for this? Yeah. I mean, no, I have no idea what's Rudolph coming. The red. Oh, okay. Rudolph the red nosed <laughs> reindeer. I, I I don't think his nose glows. His nose does not glow. It does not glow. So he's not bioluminescent. No, it doesn't glow. If you saw it. If you saw his nose, you might think, you might right. even say, you would say, that say it, it glows. glows. Yeah, it doesn't glow. So if we're taking the song as canon and the origins, let's say, because mm. uh, I have not done any research on this, right. I'm just going right. from the song because Huck likes the song when uh, he eats. He won't eat unless you sing the song to him. So <laughs> I've been exploring the song quite a bit. Sure, diving deep into the lore, and I like the idea that people don't know that Huck is an infant and not my. <laughs> Your brother, or brothers. right, yeah. <laughs> your, <laughs> your boss. Yeah. But it doesn't glow. But all the cartoons depict the nose as glowing, mm -hmm. and they're wrong. It doesn't glow. Right. It's almost reflective. Yeah. It's just reflective. And, it you know, it's kind of bad leadership on Santa's part that he would think that it's foggy. There's not a direct light source for it to shine off of for him to, like, direct his sleigh. So it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's got dark. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about that. Sure, just get it. I up felt like I needed I needed somebody to tell this to because <laughs> it was it was revelatory for me. Well, and just, I feel like I mean it's one of those things that just yeah. because it isn't mentioned in the song doesn't mean it's not a thing. Like Humpty Dumpty, for example. Like nowhere is it mentioned that he's an egg. Right, but that's wrong that he's an egg because there aren't eggs that walk around and fall off. I mean, I guess there are eggs that fall off. Um, counters and fall off high fence, areas. fences and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I can't tell you the number of times my egg has fallen off a fence. <laughs> but there is no point where anyone tries to put them back together again. Right. Right. The egg shatters and they're like, oh, that's that's the end of it. Yeah. Well, that's the end of that. Yeah. I mean, maybe he's a Fabergé. That's, that's possible. But still, not historically something that walks around and talks and people, I guess people do put, try and put them back together again. Maybe it was a Fabergé egg. That's a good one. Well, but also uh, they, it doesn't say that he can walk or talk or anything. He just sat on a wall and he fell 
and nobody could put it back together. Okay. I mean, I guess it's, I mean, I guess technically you're right by omission. Well, same thing. Same thing about Rudolph. Like they don't mention that his nose glows. <laughs> I feel like we shouldn't have to cover all the things that he, is not happening <laughs> with somebody. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but you're, you're, you are right insofar as it is implied that it glows because you would even say it glows. Um, it was very no, shiny. It's not implied at all. It's shiny. Yeah. It's not implied at all that it glows. You're saying like, oh, I, it even looks like it's glowing. It's so bright. Right. I'm not like immediately thinking that it's glowing. Like it's not like, oh, it's, there's something very bright outside. It's glowing. Like I'm no, thinking, oh, it must I, be just shiny. But you do that all the time with your lights, you know, like your car lights. Like a light will be reflecting off of it. And you're like, are, are those lights on? Like, and you have to kind of like move around in position to kind of see. You're like, oh, okay, no, that's just something reflecting off. Right. You, maybe I would say that they were glowing, but I was wrong. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so we're we're agreeing at each other. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad we got that covered. I just I'm glad I got that off my chest. Right. Right. So now we can move on to Star Trek Picard season three episode one, the mm-hmm. next generation. Yeah. The or next generation. Just like we did with Prodigy, uh, the next generation season eight episode one. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So can we just jump right into it and talk about all the okay. frustrations? Yeah. I don't. I mean, I didn't write down the blurb. It was because I couldn't be bothered to type it in. <laughs> so do you have it in front of you? Do um, we need it? I mean, it, it's it's the start of Picard that immediately dismisses everything from seasons one and two and jumps into uh, winking and nodding to the audience about Next Generation. And who can blame them, really? <laughs> they did the same thing with between seasons one and two, kind um, of. I, right, I, I kind of can. Like, I have a full note about this. Like, it, it's just, who is this for? You know, like... How how dumb do they think the audience is? Like anyone who's watching season three of Picard is someone who knows the show and all of Next Generation and probably informed themselves of all the behind the scenes stuff. Or it's the people specifically who didn't want to be spoiled. And so just all of the all of the visuals and like the the nods and winks to Next Generation and like the the presentation of people when they show up. It was just highlighted in a way that was just like, eh, you know, who's this person? Like, oh, there's Will at the bar. Such a weird thing. Can, can I just point out to everyone that because Patrick Stewart is so old, all of these scenes cannot be done in what you would consider a Star Trekian manner, right. where they're on their way to something. They're on their way to engineering or they're beaming somewhere and they're like, it's there's not a lot of motion. Oh, kind of like the so West Wing style just, where like, there's, yeah, like walk and talk mm-hmm. or something yeah. like that. He's so old that I think that he has to be seated. Like immediately you'll notice that whenever a scene happens and it's going to be an extended scene, he finds a seat. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it and, and the scene that happens between Will Riker and John Luke Picard in the bar. Why is this scene happening in a bar? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's because they're at a table and they can sit down at a table and it's easy. Right. right? That scene does not belong at a bar. It belongs like either Jean-Luc Picard coming to get him or they're on their way somewhere. Right. They're going somewhere. Like, I don't understand like this whole this whole conceit at the beginning where Jean-Luc Picard gets the message from Beverly Crusher. Right. Mm hmm. That whole scene where, which is where the episode should have started. By so the way. sorry. All of this stuff at the beginning. <laughs> Just, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and throw in like a couple lines of the blurb. Um, after you said after she, he gets a message from, uh, from Dr. Crusher, but it's after receiving a cryptic, urgent distress call from Dr. Beverly Crusher. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. The whole beginning of this didn't make any sense because he right. gets the call, like, and he's like, what is going on? And you're like, oh, mystery, intrigue. Great even though we know who it's from. Well, <laughs> like, right. It would have been way better if we didn't know who it was from. But also just that moment where he's like, what, what is it? Uh, he's like, oh, oh I, you know, the cryptic message, blah, blah, blah. And he like takes two steps away from it. And he's like, myriad? You know, and it's like, where? What? Why? Yeah, where where did that come from? Yeah. I like that myriad is like the servant that comes in with his coffee. It's like, <laughs> Thank you, myriad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even before that, like just uh, the the writing in this episode. Hopefully, it gets better. But it's just it's so what's that called? Like not not foreshadowing, not not projecting. Dumb, right? Uh, virtue. What's the rest of that phrase? Virtue signaling. Signaling. Yeah, there's so much signaling in it. Um, he like you know he's he's standing there 
listening to the message or seeing the message, he's like, why would anyone send a coded message to a more than 20 year old enterprise D communicator? Like, why does he say that out loud? <laughs> why don't you open it and find the fuck out? Right. Don't the card. <laughs> like it's, it's like, well, I can't think of a reason why they would do that. So I'm not going to open it. <laughs> right. Well, he couldn't figure out the message. And then he walks away and he's like, Oh, myriad. And then he's, he says, right. uh, you know, Picard, um, four, seven alpha tango, I think, or alpha. Yeah. Uh, which is from alpha first contact, yeah. which by the way, they quote the music from and insurrection in this quite a bit. It's mm-hmm. very strange. The choices that they made with the scoring. Yes. And the, the main title better. that happens at the, at the end of the show. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're like, that was, that, that was all the cold open. That's well, yeah, that's the end. <laughs> I'd be fine with that, by the way. That's the, that's the end credits to, First contact. So oh, they just okay. copied and pasted the end credits. I don't even think they re-recorded it. Right. I don't know why they did that. It was very, very off putting. Anyway, what were we talking about? Oh yeah. So he gets this. He gets this message. Well, and- so sorry. Can I, can I back it up to Crusher really quick? Okay. Or do you want to finish your point? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, I hope that I wasn't the only one who did this, but she turns around and she looks at the screen and she goes, "They found us." And immediately I went, "I don't know how, but they found us." Run for it, Marty. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I actually have to say it was it, like that beginning was was okay with me i oh, liked see, the beginning right. up until the point where we didn't need there to be a shootout right it did not need to happen no like it, it could like it could have been an abbreviated they try and beam on she shoots them or, or somehow cleverly perhaps incapacitates them as opposed to her taking up arms something she's never done since insurrection and when she did insurrection it was stupid too Right. Right. These these characters are not people who take up arms. They are cleverer than that. Yeah. She's a doctor, not right? a fighter. Right. And then they had and then they had this moment where she said, send this to Jean-Luc Picard. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you saying that? Like, we didn't know he was in the show. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. And like, uh, as if we didn't know that that's who you were going to send it to. Like, that's why you're on the I show. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was so stupid. That's why this whole beginning did not need to happen. I understand you need something exciting to happen for the opening of the season three, but come up with something different because it was stupid. Yeah. To go back to that scene with when John Luke gets the message, it should have started right then and there. Not the stuff where they're packing up to go somewhere, which is going to be, is going to be meaningless throughout this whole episode. Her, her whole character, I forget her name. Laris. His Romulan girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. I predict that she is not going to play a part. I know everybody knows the answer to this. Who's <laughs> listening, who watches Picard. Right. Uh, it could be sounding like an idiot, <laughs> but I have a feeling they shipped her off like they did with Lois Lane in Superman 3. Like, she's just gone now. Yeah, <laughs> right? I, I do it, appreciate that they gave her a send off and it wasn't just in like a line of dialogue. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think that we're going to see her again. Right. Maybe in episode and, 10. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, maybe she'll sort of be peppered in, but she will not play a role in this season. And this idea that he gets this call to action from Beverly that he knows about, like he's obviously familiar in some way with this, whatever it code name, Hellfire, whatever. Hellbird, yeah. He wasn't immediately packing and being like, I have to go. My friends are in trouble. He, he sits down and says, let's deconstruct this message with each other and decide whether or not I should take the time to go rescue my friend or if we should continue packing to go on vacation. Right. Right. It's, it was so like, so un- of a scene because nothing comes yeah. from it. We know he's going to go. Well, other than major foreshadowing of, I am not a man who needs a legacy. And also I want a new adventure. Like <laughs> it was just, I know they didn't have to set it up. Just go on the adventure. Just yeah. go do it. Yeah. Right. Just you don't need this thing where we have to acknowledge that he's retired and blah, blah, blah. Right. By the and, way, so there's a lot of banging going on back out. I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, yeah. But I'm sure it's coming through on the microphone. <laughs> right. And I can't wait to see what it sounds like when it's recorded. Hopefully it will be taken out. But if if not, I apologize to everybody. They're working it on the floor. And, oh, uh, it sounds like they're going to be doing it entirely for the recording of this episode. And then they will stop immediately after we stop recording. Yeah. Well, I, I genuinely thought that it was just Huck playing in the background. Um, which, by the way, I love the idea of Huck being your brother or your your boss, like just <laughs> referencing him as if he's one of those. Kind of is, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. But- anyway, so th- that whole that whole this whole beginning, it yeah. just it just doesn't make sense. And I, I like I like that they have this kind of mystery going on that seems to 
is going to take a long time to unpack. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm glad it's happening. But this whole thing where we have to talk every single episode or sorry, every single scene about what it means and they have to philosophize about what everything means. And, you know, right. Like we don't, we're not here for that. We're not here for you to philosophize on your age and how you don't know if you mean anything. And it's, it, it's, it's meaningless. That's yeah. not why we're here. Yeah. Yeah. It was the, that again, like the script was written so poorly, like that, that exposition was just painful to get through. And, yeah. you know, and I, I don't know if part of it is just Patrick Stewart's age at this point that it's it's a, a little bit harder for him to get into those places emotionally um or if it was just the dialogue back and forth but it was just you know like the the part where he's like uh well no you wouldn't know about that code because it was incapa- you were incapacitated you know and he's like incapacitated oh like you you need to stop spoon feeding the audience all of this stuff and it was probably 25 minutes of episode that they had to stretch out into an hour that's my guess. Like they had, they, mm. they wrote the whole story, the whole arc of the season. See, and I feel and like they, they had did that to sub- too. subdivide that. They had to subdivide it into 10 episodes. And this got, I mean, they had to extend every episode has to be an hour or whatever. And this one got the shaft. Right. I guess. See, and because they didn't have enough. It's, it's the same thing about like them, their, their plan. Actually, it's more of a ruse or whatever. Like they didn't need to describe it before they did it. You know, Will could have said, yeah. I, I have a plan. It's it's not a big one, but it's a plan. And then, boom, they're on the Titan. And Seven can say, yeah. this, this inspection was a little bit sudden. You know, and they can explain it to that person. The scene with, with Captain Dick, I, right. I felt like was interesting because it was him rebelling against these old geezers who were trying to commandeer his ship or maybe, maybe he's kind of suspecting there's something weird going on. I don't know, but I thought it was interesting. Maybe it went on a little too long, but at least something was happening that wasn't nostalgia based. It was actually, Oh, here's a new character and he is at odds with them. Yeah. But his at odds was also unnecessarily condescending. You know, he's like, I hope you enjoy your quarters. It's the best we could do on such short notice. And it's like, yeah, you know, they're going to be like in the corner next to the engineering room. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of am waiting for there to be a reason for his antagonism. I don't it's not entirely clear other than he doesn't appreciate people getting in his way. Right. I mean, I, I can't imagine someone like him talking like that to all admirals and all superior officers. I mean, I don't think anyone in there is a superior officer. I mean, you'd think that Will Riker would be in some way superior, even though they have the same rank just because he's older. Right. But there's like no respect for that. There's no um, reverence for any of their seniority. So I don't, I gu- I'm guessing that he's got, there's some kind of beef he has with these people. It's going to come up. Like he's the son of somebody that got killed on a, on one of their enterprise missions. I think there's going to be something, right? There's got to be. And I, well, I Otherwise, feel like you're why? giving him the benefit of the doubt. I think that they just needed him to be antagonistic. So they were like, you're antagonistic. Um, right. Almost one dimensionally. Right. Well, yeah. Like, you know, uh, he, he could have been deferential and respectful and still say no. He did not have to be a dick the whole, I mean, the whole time. You know, he's know, like the whole time. Like, I mean, he doesn't even show up for like, I was like, where's the captain? Like this idea that these guys show up for an inspection and he's not present when they come on board. He's not present when they go on the bridge. Right. He is just present at dinner. He started dinner, by the way, whatever he's eating is not meat. No. <laughs> Something and it did else. not look good. Well, and the same thing, like why, why the close ups on all of that stuff? Like what was the point of that di- art direction? Well, I, I will say. The best part about this show so far, or I should say this season, is, I'm going to wait for the hemming to stop, is, (laughs) it is beautiful. Something happened. I mean, the show normally looked good, right? The previous two seasons. Mm -hmm. But this looked beautiful. Like, Strange New World's beautiful. I mean, I guess they brought over the same crew or something like that to to (laughs) And they might have. I know that they, I know that they're working on... Uh, consolidating and collaborating the writers' rooms for these shows, so there's a lot more continuity and a lot less um, repeat of disasters and situations. Right. Well, I, it just I was just blown away at how good it looks, mm-hmm. especially with like the <laughs> the Rafi stuff. Which, just to, as a side note, to get off of the Captain Dick for a second, 
the whole Rafi side, like when she's introduced, I was so like, oh no, they're throwing her off the wagon again. And I was thinking to myself, oh God, how much do I not care about this? And I, I have a note right here. How much do we not care about Rafi now? Now that she's like not part of Starfleet again, and she's fallen off the wagon again. And they, they, they pulled a, a one-two punch on us or a sneakeroo. Interesting. <laughs> Right. Well, it, right. Well, I just I didn't see it that way. I guess I kind of might have been watching from a slightly more jaded position. The fact that she was in Starfleet at the end of season two, I was like, all right, she's undercover. Because also like the questions she started asking to like try to get into Starfleet. I'm like, why would you be asking your dealer this stuff? Like, what's the information that he's going to know that it would like get you back into Starfleet? Well, you did not check out immediately upon seeing or about <laughs> like I was I immediately was like, oh. I was just, I'm going to check my email now to get through this scene where we go through this yet again. So good for you. Good for you to have faith in the show Well, because I lost it. And I guess good for good on them for you that you actually perceived it the way they intended it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, I was pleasantly surprised and they had a little moment where she, it was tempted by whatever drugs she bought. That was cool. Yeah. And then she, she drops it. Yeah. yeah. I liked it. Um, I, I hope that it does not play a huge role in her character again. You know, the um, I hope like the we, fighting we off the drugs, on. you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like just uh, her whole addiction thing. I just it's it feels very stale to me. And I hope that they do not dwell on it. Right. Um, But the whole environment that she's in is like, meanwhile, on Blade Runner. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, it is like they must have used that right. as a model for, for wherever they are, whatever she's doing. Yeah. And it it's one of the things that kind of doesn't sit well with me with Star Trek. And I get that there are people who are fans of it, and this is more of a personal preference rather than like an actual problem with Star Trek. But just so many things are dark and gritty now that I feel like it it doesn't have to be. You know, like even season two where they were they were at night at the chateau. Like same thing here. Like why why does it have to be all dark and shadowy? Yeah. I mean I I I like the way it looks. I don't like I, there was a, a couple of moments where I was thinking, eh, this doesn't feel Star Trekian to me, I, but I still like it. And I was hoping that they maybe bridge the gap between that modern style and some kind of semblance of Star Trek, that familiarity. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they got there or not. I mean, I appreciate that they're trying to do new things. Mm-hmm. Sure. But, um, and, but and I, I feel like if it's, if there's no intention behind it, if it's kind of unmotivated with these weird things, um, I don't, I, I just, I'm kind of waiting for there to be a purpose for it, you know? Right. And granted, this is not the, the early nineties television show. This is, they have to kind of wow you and they are wowing us. With, sure. I mean, this is, is an expensive show. Right. I mean, this must be the most expensive season of this show and that space station and the new Titan just they all look so cool when they're on the sh- the ship. I mean, they they spared no expense to mm-hmm. make this look like a million bucks. As it was, you know? yeah, leaving the dock. Um, and it was interesting just you talking about the music, how much of it was copy paste. Because I was I was thinking how there was crew of the Next Generation and there was crew of the Voyager leaving on the Titan, and so I thought it would be really cool if they did some kind of mashup of those themes. But when it was leaving, it was getting this very like thematic music in the background um but yeah you know but it was it was kind of like why like we don't we don't know the titan there's nothing that is nostalgic or inspiring of the titan yet other than it was riker's ship originally but i want to go um to a little bit before that where they learn that laforge's daughter is on the crew uh, or in the crew um Mm -hmm. i think I, I, I didn't research this, but I think that's actually Lavar's daughter as well. Um, so, you know, it is it is Lavar Burton's daughter and LaForge's daughter, which is kind of cool. Oh, interesting. Um, that's pretty cool. I wonder if she is the daughter of who is the creator of the ship. What we saw an episode <laughs> where she's a computer. Is that the computer computer offspring of what's her name? I know her name is. Come on, you got this. I you got this. I don't. I'm sorry. But here's the thing. Oh. I don't have to because our audience knows who you're talking about. Like, and this is going to tie into my next my next bit. Like, the dialogue is so heavy handed in this. When Will sees her, he's like, wait, 
wasn't your nickname Crash LaForge? Because you crashed? And then it was like, that's why they named you Crash. Because you crashed. When you crashed, they started calling you Crash because you crashed. Like... <laughs> I know. <laughs> yep, we we got it. There wasn't even like it wasn't even familiar banter. It just felt very awkward. Yeah, like well, she didn't know them. Like she like they were kind of overstepping and like in front of like her all of her crewmates. It's like oh god, she's she's gonna be ostracized permanently now. Right. I mean that's kind of what parent friends do. So like that part was fine. But like you, her name Crash LaForge says it all. <laughs> like Crash is not <laughs> a good sure thing. They would all know. They would all know. They weren't, this was not news to all of them, right? Right. All the crew people. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been amazing if he was like, wait, didn't they call you Crash LaForge in Starfleet? And then somebody on like Helm is like, oh, I totally forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> or they just giggle and that's Sir. the end of it. Right? right. That's the end of the exchange. There's yep. not, there's not go back and forth 15 more times. Yeah. That whole scene. Did you feel like when. When Seven, or rather Annika, is it Henson or Hansen? It's I Anakin it's H-A-N. Hansen. She's H-A-N? H-A-N-N-S-E-N, yeah. So Picard keeps calling her Henson. And yeah. I was wondering about that. I don't know if that's on, if that's just because he's old. <laughs> I don't have no idea. <laughs> right. But that whole scene to me where she offers to let him give the order to take the ship out of dry dock or space dock, whatever. Mm-hmm. And it felt like the end of the show, right. like they had all been working up and she was out of Starfleet. And then she finally found her way back in. There she was finally getting to take the, the ship out. You know, like she said, said she had confided in Picard earlier in the show that I've always wanted to take a, sh- a ship out of space dock. It's the thing that symbolized my arrival into civilization from the board. Sure. And that she, and she's like, I think you should do it number seven (laughs) you should call her number seven (laughs) this is my number one this is my number seven what happened to the others don't worry about it um so number seven i think it's your job and then she doesn't she's like like she hadn't done this a thousand million times before and by the way um i'm pretty sure it's not that big of a deal to take a ship out of dry dock i know all you're saying is take us out yeah, and it's like the easy should be the easiest thing that we do this like any any time at any point. They've even said multiple <laughs> times that it's normally done on autopilot. Well, you know how I feel about this, Jonathan. Yes, that <laughs> anybody driving a ship is stupid because they wouldn't they wouldn't be driving it because why would you? Right, right. Anyway, yeah. sorry, but yeah, that whole scene just felt very conclusive to me. Yeah, like this the the, the music like it was dun 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 dun, dun you know, uh-huh. and it it. It, I, why were we making a moment out of it? Right, right. It just felt weird. It just felt it, it felt like it was, they like, well, we need another scene. Let's do this scene. Well, and Let's ag- make it bigger. And again, the dialogue was very spoon feeding. Like it was just ridiculous foreshadowing where he's like, you'll, you'll be a captain before you know it. And it's like, we have yet to meet the captain and the captain is a guest star. And then she by far had the best bit of dialogue in the whole thing where he starts explaining who Dr. Crusher is. And she just goes, I know who she is. Like, She's standing in for the audience. Well, we actually need them to follow around everybody in the show. We need seven to follow around everybody so she can say, yeah, we know who they are. Right. We we don't need to be. Yeah. Yeah. You you can just keep going. Keep going. Like they know. Just keep going. Yeah. 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 We don't care if it's a 30 minute episode. Let's just keep moving. Right. Keep us moving. Don't Uh, sit down. Don't sit down. let's, Let's get up. And honestly, I feel like that would have been so much better if they, if they had gone to the producers and said like, we we are going to make seven episodes. They're going to be tighter. We are not going to fill in. Um, and and it's just going to tell the story the way we want it from start to end. Right. We're going to make people want a fourth season, right? Yeah, exactly. Get, I mean, yeah. which apparently like- is what happened anyway, just because there was so much fan service throughout. But we'll see. You know, I'm okay with the fan service as long as it's motivated in some way. I'm, I'm okay with them referencing things. It's okay to me. I mean, that's that's why we have that's why you rebooted or rather rather why you brought back all of these people. Well, yes, and Strange New Worlds new does it fantastically. Picard never has. No. Yeah. I mean, I I wonder if it will speed up if they felt like this first episode is they needed to cover a lot of ground, right. which they didn't, but maybe they felt they had to. Yeah. to get everybody moving. And, you know, I mean, I don't know if you saw at the very beginning uh, but there was a like a, a box that said 
Commander Jack Crusher on it. I don't know if that's her old dead husband. Yeah, it is. Or if that's another person. Okay. And there was a reveal that she has another son. <laughs> Not Leslie. This is all just a slap in the face to Will Wheaton, right? Seriously. Like, you already have a son. You already have a son. And they're like, no, we're going to create a new son. Well, that like and that also better. he he never shows up in the episode or in the series at all. Uh, to my knowledge, maybe he does have like an uncredited cameo in the same way that he did at the end of season two. Um, but but yeah, like for for dealing with Crusher's child and Picard's. Are you assuming that it's Picard's child? Uh, Is yeah. That we're... Yeah. I mean, I mean, that makes I, mean, I feel like they're seeding that. Right. The fact that it was 20 years ago, him. like since they last saw her, they she talked just disappeared. About it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I so that's that's my assumption. Um, but yeah, for regardless, for it to be Crusher's kid and for her other kid not to like who has these powers where he can just kind of like cue himself around the universe to not show up at all for any point for any reason like just seems you're right seems like a slap in the face to to will yeah he might play a role later because they they set him up in the end of last season so i don't know if they're going to do anything with that he may not want to yeah maybe he just doesn't like acting anymore i don't know anyway yeah um so, by the way, going back to, uh, okay. to Rafi for a second. Actually, I was <laughs> about to as well. So that where, works. Yeah. There's a moment where she's talking to this dealer person and she pays some exorbitant amount of money to pay him for him to say, I heard the red lady is the target. And that's all I know. It's like, I just paid that much money. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <Right>. nothing. <laughs> Could have made that up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, just the red lady in shows like this, the encryption is just enough that you can investigate it and figure it out and it's not either like the direct information because the people who are sneaking around just need to know what it is or completely opposite where the only people who can figure out what it is are the people who know what it is and they have to share that information with you but to like say red lady you know and she's going through all of these things and then she's like maybe it's an upcoming holiday and she finds the, the red lady statue uh, I, it just felt like, why do we need to direct her? Why can't she have learned about the thing and then rush back to warn them? And she's too late. Why does there have to be this sure. kind of nothing seen? Like, just just make it so she's too late. I didn't understand when she finally gets back to wherever she went. It was that San Francisco? I can't remember. Um, yeah. Wherever that is. Right. And she's trying to hail them. She says, hey, this is an emergency. I need to talk to somebody some serious shit's about to go down and nobody answers her. And I, I didn't understand why that was the case because I, I thought didn't... maybe, Oh, they beamed everybody out or there's nobody there, but oh, that's not right. what happened. Right. Right. It was so cool I, I... to see what happened. Yeah. The portal gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and I, I didn't either. Like I was confused by that as well. But once they showed that, like that rim around the, the building, I I assumed that that ring was already there. We just hadn't seen it yet. And that was what was causing the d- disturbance. But it's so weird how, like, I mean, this, this, the fact that we're trying to figure out what they meant, there are things that they spoon feed us and blatantly explain that is really irrelevant. But this, we're like, wait, why, why could she not get through? <laughs> like, what was the problem? <laughs> Yeah, it, it felt like they just needed her to not be able to get through, and so she doesn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really informed, right? right. There's this, not a lot of information going back and forth between characters, and when it should be, it's just kind of like it's sort of edging its way away from science fiction, where the plot lines are confined by the plausibility from of a scientific perspective, right? Right. That's mm-hmm. the that, that's where we come from with science fiction, and so this idea that things are just happening or not happening based on convenience and not the confines of the scientific world and and the rules that they've established for the past 40 years, right? 50 years, 60 years. Um, This idea that, Oh, we'll just have her not be able to get through to anybody. That's easier. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, it just is what it felt like. I mean, maybe this is the first episode. Maybe we will eat our words. Um, for the second episode, but I don't know. I, you know <laughs> I, what? I, I would, I would be going. completely fine if we ate our words on the tenth episode because I don't think it's going to happen. Like we, we were irritated by season one. We 
were burned by season two, I think we're going to get the same thing from seasons one and two that we did, or we're going to get the same things in this season that we did from seasons one and two. Right. I mean, I don't think it's a bad first episode. I, th- I don't think it's great. I don't think it's maybe not. It's it's sort of just average. Yeah. Right. Yep. 100%. It, it just doesn't, nothing happens. I mean, I feel like if they, now they have momentum, things are happening. We now know the stakes. Right. I, I did like that the, the episode's title actually did fit in with kind of what was happening in the episode. Like we did see the next generation. Like we saw LeVar's kid. We saw Crusher's kid. They were on the next Titan. So like the, the title did fit. It wasn't just a wink and a nod to the audience. Um, it could very well be that they're going to hand it off to these new characters. Right. All of the old, the, the next generation crew will be absent and it will be in the next generation of Star Trek and they will just keep going with this. I don't know what they'll call it. <laughs> I know. But, <laughs> uh, the continuation. But, um, or maybe his, maybe the Beverly's new child will be, you know, whatever his name is, Jack Picard, which is kind of a badass name. Jack Picard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's almost like Jack Ryan, I guess a little bit. Right. And John Luke Picard mixed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the scene where they had taken the shuttle and they were going to save Crusher, uh, again, like, I don't know how much of it is Jonathan and Patrick, like just not having that same level of banter as they did, or how much of it is just that the dialogue is so poorly written that they are struggling to make it interesting, but like they're, they're pulling up and Riker goes friend or foe. And it was like, what? You, why are you saying it in an overly dramatic way? You know, and then like he, how Picard gets up and he's like, my hands are sweating. It's, you know, I'm getting an adrenaline rush. And he's like, for the adventure or for seeing Crusher. And he's like, both, you know, it's like, why, why are you having these lines of dialogue with each other? If you are like such good friends, you don't need to be feeding each other these setups for these one liners. Yeah. And this whole urge to, to have all of the old crew be friends now. Because if you think about all of the interactions and the interplay between Riker and Picard on the show, the, mm-hmm. the Star Trek show from the 80s and 90s, they weren't friends. They weren't particularly friendly. They had exchanges that were important and productive and professional. But I think that they rarely had a sort of a, a chummy relationship. I mean, Picard wasn't chummy with anybody unless... They were a 20 year old <laughs> right. girl on another right. planet. Um, but if you think about this idea that why do we now, why do they all now have to be this chummy friendship type of thing? Like what, why not have them have the same relationship? Like they never hung out. I mean, as far as we could tell, I mean, they, they hung out, like they had dinner with each other maybe, but it was never, they would never share old stories or something like that. They never had this thing where they had a shorthand mm. uh, friendship shorthand. Right. But now they do. Yeah. I don't know. I I feel like it did develop over the seven seasons. I feel like their relationship that they had in season one was spot on. Um, you know, where Picard went to go see him and his his cabin, you know, was he he pretended that it was a ship. Um it was a shelf. His cabin was just a shelf on a wall. I think it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I can kind of see your point. I just I feel like that is the foregone conclusion that they would just be friends now. Right. And I don't think you have to do it that way. Like I'm sure LeVar Burton, Jordy is going to be chummy with everybody too. And mm-hmm. Deanna is going to be chummy with everybody too. Like no one's going to be mad at each other. There's, I mean, I guess there is a little bit of friction or implied friction between Riker and Deanna. It was like, they, they were very awkward about it. it Compl- he right. says they don't, they, they want me to be gone. And Picard's like, Oh, yeah, the awkward. end. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, and as a friend, that is something that you would explore. Especially because they're at a bar. Right. They're not on their way. Like, the, the, the Bombay doors aren't about to open when, when to go on the ship, right? They have some time. They have some travel time where they can discuss the problems, his marital problems. No, so, you're, yeah, sorry. That That's when it should have happened. Like, Picard is like, okay, look, here's the issue with Crusher. And then when they're flying and they've got nothing else to do, that's when Picard yeah. can be like, so you and Deanna... Yeah, I'm glad they didn't. I'm sure there was a scene. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I thought that maybe Riker was going to start macking on seven a little bit. Uh huh. Like he's like, that's seven. She, uh, she's something else, not Picard. She's not <laughs> just like, a seven. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're like nine and a half. Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, I wonder where they're going with that. I mean, it, it would be nice if maybe the crew, they weren't all super chummy with each other. No, you know, I just, no. I, I, you know would, where they're going with it? So there is unnecessary, it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. So there's unnecessary drama and tension between Riker and Deanna when they're on the bridge together. When they, when she finally shows up, you mean? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's very possible. I wonder if their kid will play a role in this because I actually liked her. Right. From the second season. I think it was the second season. I was say season? no. I it was in the first season. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Meh, probably not. Too much yeah. stuff going on. Maybe she's part of the next generation. Eh? Because she does have some like talents, right? She must. Doesn't she yeah. have a talent of some kind? Well, she's quarter beta, she, so she's got to have something. She can at least be really good at reading people. Maybe she can sense that the person is lying. <laughs> right. Or that they're hiding something. That they're hiding something. <laughs> I'll be in my quarters. I think I've I think I'm done here. <laughs> Riker out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I it's it's hard to tell from this particular episode. I felt like because this had really good nuggets of mystery and some science fiction stuff. And there's this whole Rafi handler situation, which I'm sure the handler will turn out to be Brent Spiner, right? Something like that. We turn out to be somebody that we know. Otherwise, why keep Completely. their identity a secret? Right. Uh, unless the, the person is like a straight up antagonist in the show that you know, has been like misleading it seems too her. Obvious. It seems too obvious, right? But it being somebody we know is not too obvious? <laughs> well, no, it seems too obvious that they would be a bad guy. But if you're in the minds of the writers, like, oh, they'll never, they'll never see this coming. It's going to be data. Right. Again. It's going to be Bar- Berkeley. Someone did a time machine backup of data and he's back. Time machine is the Apple backup software where it backs, backs your data up to a separate hard drive. So in case you lose uh, your computer to a, uh, a Romulan explosion. Oh, right. You can you can reboot it. That's that's for the people who don't know what time machine is. Got it. Got it. Do you think I need to explain further? Or can we I, move on? According to the writers of this series, yes, you do. You need to like. <laughs> <laughs> need a friend to come in and tell me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, like nothing else. I mean, I felt like all the stuff, like the last couple of acts, was was not bad. You know, I, I feel like. What's going to happen to Seven? I mean, something's going to happen, right? This huge ship is going to, that is now attacking Beverly's ship. Uh, That's how they ended it. Uh, I'm assuming the Titan is going to intervene in some way and uh, something's going to happen with them. Like, I think the Titan is going to play a a big role in this season. It must, right? They spent so much time setting it up. Why would they abandon it? Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm more disappointed because there was so much in seasons one and two of the same characters now to just completely dismiss them except for Rafi. It feels kind of like a screw you to the first two seasons, you know, and it's just like, okay, well that was, that was all a ruse to get us back to the next generation. So I, I'm kind of okay with it. If the first two seasons were these amazing things, maybe it would be insulting, but I feel like I'm okay with them leaving that stuff behind. Like, That's fair. please don't reference them because then we're just spending more time referencing things we don't like. But even just with like, dism- you know, dismissive dialogue, like I would, I, I am, I am very curious to know if they're going to do anything with that Borg blend that was at the end of season two. Would be really cool. If there's one thing that they, I hope they brought back and I, this was in the back of my mind while I was watching it is what's her name? Dr. What's her name? Who's Girardi. Borg queen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that would be cool because I'm, I'm assuming that the Federation are now somewhat tentative friends with the Borg. Right. Which I is know. an interesting thing. Interesting thing that maybe they should explore. <laughs> well, and like, and, and same thing. Like there was that huge threat in at the end of season one and at the end of season two. I don't know if it was the same thing or not. Like that I'm very curious to know if they're going to bring it back to eliminate it in season three or if they're just like, yeah. Our friends, the Borg, are fighting this thing for us. We're just going to let them do it. I thought it was just some sort of weird anomaly that they had to contain and it was done. Well, but there was that like super advanced cyber beings at the end of season one. 
where the tentacles came out for, of the like portals. I half expected that to be what it was. Right. I thought that in, when when Rafi witnesses the destruction of whatever Starfleet thing that was, mm. I thought the portal that opened up that was coming through, I thought that was the stuff from season one, like the, the robots from season one. It wasn't. Right. Spoilers. <laughs> but yeah. I felt like the aliens were cool. We got a glimpse of the aliens when Crusher was fighting them at the beginning. Right. I thought those were neat. I liked their their language or the way that they communicated that was interesting it was like oh an interesting race where they are wearing masks or where they weren't not wearing masks it was hard to tell but they did say that they look different every single time they show up did you catch that yeah i don't know what that means what does that mean that's like org stuff right yeah it's different races but the same race type of thing right yeah any predictions uh on what you just said no because i that that i know but um uh, any predictions beyond that? I <laughs> we're gonna get the crew together. I think that there's gonna be bad dialogue, unnecessary tension. <laughs> um, yeah, there's gonna I, be some wasted time on on interpersonal stuff that just isn't relevant to the plot at all. It's just like let's get these two p- characters talking to each other, and I'm not gonna appreciate that. I'm gonna feel like eh, when they did that in the old show, what made it interesting was that it either was relevant to the show mm-hmm. or it was in passing. It was on their way from the bridge to the holodeck or the bridge to engineering when they settled their differences. <laughs> and that's the amount of time that they had to do that, right? Right. There wasn't five to seven minute scenes where they're philosophizing over their lives. So I think you're right. I think we're going to have some of that. I think that um, this whole intrigue of what are these people after? Like, what is going on? Like, we have no sense. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no, mm-hmm. it's not like, oh, I remember we destroyed a planet and they might be mad about that. Like, there wasn't that conversation about who these people are and why they might be um, wanting to kill everybody. Um, I hope that there's some motivation there. I hope that there's, it's not just bad guys wanting to kill people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I just got, uh, I just saw Gardens of the Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Um, and it made me realize that all the guardians movies, the villain is the hero in their own story. Like they are, they are trying to make things better by controlling these people or destroying them. Right. And, and it, it, you know, just seeing three and like coming into this. Yes. Like that is my, my hope that it is not just a mustache twirling villain, that it is somebody who has a personal reason for doing it and they think that they are right yeah yeah and i'm i'm wondering what brent spiner's role in this will be right and very well he very well could be the bad guy again yeah Um, that's true could be lore could be any of these different things it's funny that everybody listening to this likely has seen it and knows and they're like snapping pencils i know (laughs) like yeah um it's like no idiots right um, but uh, that's the fun part for you guys. You get to listen to us watch the show. Right? You get to listen to us be ignorant. <laughs> I know. You were like us once. All right. Well, are we done with this? Yeah. Season, I mean, ag- again, being a 10 arc season or 10 episode season, 10 episode arc, um, we, we can't really say whether or not it's proper Star Trek yet because we haven't seen the conclusion of it. Um. No, they're taking, I mean, they're, they are on the fringe of science fiction. I know, I know. Like they're not, I mean, this just looks like science fiction. It doesn't really feel like science fiction. I mean, well, it looks yeah. looks great, there, again. Yeah, there, there isn't any explanation for anything yet, so this episode alone is not proper Star Trek, um, but... The stuff with Seven was, felt very Star Trek to me. Like, we're going to do this, and, you know, ready the phasers and ready the thing like when they were all de- when they're disembarking or not disembarking whatever they were doing leaving the sure. space dock right like that felt like procedural to me it felt like oh that's that's what that felt like star trek yeah but there was no sci-fi explored no not really. yeah yeah not really i wonder if seven will make it through the whole season i mm. suspect so right it did feel like they were setting her up either to die or to have some sort of arc <laughs> Well, the captain is going to die. Like, I don't know that for sure as in like the, I saw that somewhere, but I know that for sure based on how he acted and all of the dialogue. Just because he's such a dick. Is that, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. He, could, he could be redeemed. He could redeem himself in some way. I, guess, I will say that yeah. I, I hate to spoil this for you, but he is in one of the episode thumbnails later in the show. So he's not going to die soon. Oh, okay. Way. Okay. He might die. He might be, but he might be part of the next generation. Yeah, right. Who has bequeathed <laughs> the honor to continue yeah. Star Trek. Because it is true. We don't have, other than, no, Discovery does not do, well, I don't know what Discovery is doing. We still haven't, we're, that first season's coming, everybody. We're still watching it and we're going to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> but there is no modern Star Trek that is sort of pushing the the timeline forward. We've We've jumped backwards for a lot of the different shows. Mm-hmm. But I think even, um, What's the, not Prodigy, but the other one. Um, Lord X. The other animated show. Lord X, yeah. That's sort of, that's not, that's kind of in between. That's like contemporary with the old Trek, right? Well, yeah, like I, think it's, I think it's Voyager. right after season seven of Next Generation. Right. So Picard is at the, at the, the bleeding edge of the timeline, whereas Lower Decks is in the past a little bit. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think Prodigy is too. I think Prodigy is uh, current as well in the timeline. I think Prodigy and Picard are current, concurrent. Right. Yeah, so there we go. I'm sure Janeway will make an appearance. She's already been invoked. Right. In, uh, in the show. So maybe we'll see who else gets to come on. Hopefully Neelix. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> no, no, he's in the Delta Quadrant still. What am I saying? I know, I yeah, st- he got dropped off there, yeah. Um, so it's it is entirely possible that he will be on Prodigy. That'd be kind of cool. That'd be kind of cool. What it? What it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I've been Jonathan. Okay. And I've been Paul. And this has been the measure of an episode. So when I do this, <laughs> the obvious one is the obvious one is Picard, right? Oh, I thought you were going to so okay. remember. Captain remember, Dick. I'm going to make a prediction. Who are we going to see? How do you be a dick? Like, can you do it? You are better at this. You do it as Captain Dick. Like, I, I can't do that. Like, you're better at like being cartoony because he is a cartoon right now. So be, right. be cartoony, Captain Dick, and and sign us off. Uh, but you already knew that. But you already knew that. No, like, he's not really that kind of sarcasm, is he? No, he's not like. But you already knew that. That's not. That's like bitchy. <laughs> right. No, he's 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 very condescending and dismissive. He's really good at it. Like mm. you hate him immediately. <laughs> like yeah. that's the thing about those actors where you're like, oh, I, I hate that guy. Like, it's like yeah, he's the, good at it. <laughs> the the line for me was like, are you are you being condescending or is that a genuine like you survived everything? You know, where he was uh he said you're talking to an admiral. And he's like, retired. Congratulations on that. I know. <laughs> Such a, he's got like a zing for every single line. Yeah. It's so good. He's like the commensurate dick. He's the same kind of dick as in Ghostbusters, Walter Peck, 